I wanted to just give a, a little context to the, uh, the documentary we just saw and also introduce Sonia. And that context was really to um, see her documentary really, it highlights the response of, uh, uh, of Puerto Rico being like really proactive, the people not waiting for the uh, federal government or even the local government. And also, it was also looking at the, the new diaspora I mean, it's new, relatively speaking, considering uh, the diaspora that began in the 1940s. Um, this uh, whole population that's really grown in Central Florida, which is uh, really uh, very impressive. But just everything about, the, the thing about the documentary that was so uh, exciting was the, just the people, their ability, their resistance and their, their ingenuity and how they try to really um, make up and, and really take care of themselves, given the circumstances of, of the, the, uh, the devastation caused by Hurricane Maria. And, and um, firstly, now that more, more people are, are just finishing up with the documentary, I wanna thank all of you for being here and uh, just really look at the documentary uh, also in relation to uh, COVID-19, the whole crisis. Uh, one of the things that immediately uh, came up for me was the, the fact that we were having problems here, that the federal government wasn't really responding to the population here in the States. And that of course made me think, well, what's happening in Puerto Rico, given the whole context of of Hurricane Maria and how the federal government uh, responded to the needs of the island then. And so that was really, you know, something that was very alarming. And so um, let me introduce Sonia Fritz and then we can really uh, begin the Q&A with her. And then also I'll, I'll, we'll have a discussion with Siempre Sente and uh, what they're doing. Uh, Sonia Fritz is a filmmaker, of course, and a professor of literature and cinema studies at the University of the Sacred Heart in Santurce, Puerto Rico. Originally from Mexico, Sonia has lived in Puerto Rico for more than 20 years, maybe even more re recently. Uh, her most recent works are documentaries such as Mona, Treasure of the Caribbean, which is a beautiful documentary too, a wonderful documentary, and uh, 15 Lighthouses of Puerto Rico, They're really fascinating. And then also like feature films, some of her recent feature films are America, which is based on a, a novel by Esmeralda Santiago, and then um, The Kiss You Gave Me. And so that's just giving a very short bio because this is a woman who's really uh, very accomplished in, in both documentary film and feature film. So I wanted to, to ask, begin asking you, Sonia, about um, why you wanted to create this documentary. As I was saying, uh, after Maria, things were really tough in Puerto Rico. We were, we had no power for, I'm, I'm in San Juan, in, in Santurce, and for 43 days we didn't have power, and there were communities in the mountains that for one whole year didn't get power. Uh, so there was short of, of gasoline, short of, of everything, and, and we didn't see the help from the U.S. government at all, and the local government was also pretty slow. So uh, in a way, I started seeing how uh, ONGs, uh, community projects, were really taking care of themselves. And, and people like all over the island, supermarkets, everyone uh, donating and doing volunteer work. And the diaspora was really instrumental in helping people all over the island. So I was seeing that. And, and because I myself wanted to not be depressed anymore, I wanted to show the, the positive side of, of what people were doing and, and also give a voice to those who normally don't have a voice in the media. So with a, with a colleague of mine, uh, we did the research. Uh, she lives in Kawa, so she was the one that hooked me up with the community of the, the women that have, have the, the diner, the community diner. 
And she also hooked me up with the biologist who has the, the project with the fishermen. So the fishermen didn't have anything to catch because the coral reefs, we don't think about it, but coral reefs were completely destroyed. So they were unemployed basically. And, and through this project, uh, they were able then to get paid for the, for the lobster traps that they uh, rescued. And like that, the, the woman with the, uh, with, uh, the agricultural farm in, in the mountains all, all the way up in Lares, when she, has, she had lost uh, almost everything. And Those are the hydroponic, the hydroponic ex farm? Exactly, exactly. Yeah. And the artists, well, I, I saw the exhibit that they put together, basically Nikki Hano and Sonia, whom you saw in the interview, they really asked for the place. Uh, this is in the Museo de las Americas in Vallaja. This is old San Juan. And there was no light, so they opened the windows, which was really nice because when you go to visit those uh, exhibitions, it's always closed because there's air conditioning because of the artworks. But this time around, they opened the windows, so it was really nice to see the work and then see the morro and the whole beautiful landscape in the ocean. Uh, through the windows and in that exhibition uh, they were inviting every Sunday musicians to come and and also performers performing artists and poets and it was really nice and that's how I met actually the group that sings the song uh, I'm leaving I, I'm leaving me voy me voy it's a great song. Actually it. yeah it's a great song and the lyrics help so much to tell the story and so I saw them there and I asked them if I, if I could use their music for free and they said yes and it's been great. They have, they've been actually going back to, to Orlando frequently. So it was just uh, sheer luck, but it, just to tell you that so many people were doing so many interesting things and, and with humor, as you could see, and with a sense of dignity that I admire. Yeah, I, I think you it really paint an image of Puerto Rico uh, and Puerto Ricans that we normally don't see here uh, stateside. And, and so um, that's one of the things that really, really excited me about the documentary, just the whole portrayal of, of uh, Puerto Rican society uh, and, the, and the people's uh, intelligence and, and initiative under the circumstances. How did you get the whole Orlando, the whole, that whole, portrait which is yeah. significant given Puerto Rican yeah, that, 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 history. Yeah, it's a great question because this is this was a really low low budget uh, uh, documentary so we shot everything in Puerto Rico in four days and then we had three days to shoot in Orlando so I hooked up with a journalist Jose Javier Perez who's a journalist from the main newspaper here um, El Nuevo Día and uh, he had been living in Orlando now for five years and really was covering all these stories so I was reading him and and so I just called him up and said if he wanted to be part of the of the research team and he said yes he gave me the contacts uh, I traveled first uh, for a couple of days to really do a quick uh, uh, run through people and locations and and figuring out the order and everything and then I I got back with a, a camera person and sound person and then in three days we got everything done but it was really because uh, this uh, journalist had given me all the contacts and had done a lot of work and Jorge Duani the, the professor from the Florida International University I knew him because he was a colleague of mine at Sagrado Corazon now he's heading the, the um, uh, Cuban studies at, at Florida International University but he keeps writing and publishing books on migration so I thought he was really an excellent person to talk to. Yeah I mean this 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 migration is really equal practically in size to the the grand what was known as the grand migration so I mean right. Right. About right. almost like probably nearly a, a million people like slowly leaving the island, 300,000 like, uh, since 2010, but now it's really uh, been extended. And it's probably just as uh, ex extensive as the, uh, the original uh, Grand Migration. I wanted to also like just follow up this whole business of uh, the commerce between the islands, between the, because the old diaspora also contributed a great deal. I mean, we're, we're part of the, the older northeastern diaspora. And I, I think we, we were packing stuff up and sending a lot of uh, 
uh, goods down to the island as well. But I wanted to really look at this, um, this uh, the co commercial connection and also the medical connection between Central Florida and Puerto Rico and how Puerto Ricans can actually travel back and forth and, and expect that they'll be covered by these clinics. Could you like talk about that and also about Willer's Mark Supermarket and how it's becoming a franchise and, and, and all, yeah, the, all, yeah. little, all the shots. I, I, yeah, I, I was really impressed because uh, when you read uh, uh, La Novela, uh, uh, La Guagua Area, right, the, the book, and it was the back and forth from New York to, to Puerto Rico. Now it's much more with uh, Florida, especially Orlando, Kissimmee, where, where the majority of the community is. Because one, it's closer, and second, because of the weather, and because there, there was already uh, a community before the earth, before a hurricane. And then uh, recently, people that were lost everything because of the earthquakes on the uh, wow. southwestern part of the island. Have been also migrating uh, to Orlando, so this is an ongoing situation. And the good thing, in a way, is that people have kept the jobs, like like the Willer explained. He kept the jobs of the supermarkets he had in Peñuelas, which is a very depressed area because pharmaceutical companies have closed. So uh, things are very dire down there. And 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 so by him opening his first supermarket there and going through the whole trial, error and trial. Now he's selling the franchise, and as he said, I mean, there's now other investors interested in opening more supermarkets in the area because there is the audience, and they're opening. It's not just for Puerto Ricans; it's also for Venezuelans, Colombianos, uh, Dominicans, and if you go there, you hear music from all these uh, other countries. Uh, so, yeah. So, uh, Medalla opened a huge. Uh, sort of a storage place, so Medalla is consumed there now. So there's different uh, businesses, restaurants. Uh, I mean, you read in the newspaper that there's a new restaurant opening and, and so uh, this is a back and forth and, and it's helped the local economy and of course it helps our people over there to feel like more connected at home. And in terms of the medical situation, as you saw, because of the of the interview by the by the doctor, uh, she used to be traveling back and forth because this uh, group has uh, offices here in Puerto Rico. Now she decided because she was pregnant, she decided to stay there with her husband. But other doctors keep traveling and doing the back and forth. Uh, so yeah, yeah that's it. Uh, I think that's like really critical, given like the whole uh, drain. Uh, I, I know a lot of physicians and 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 health workers were leaving the island. Uh, yeah. And that also was cause of concern. I was wondering if you were thinking, and I thought maybe this is a little premature, if you were thinking of actually doing a follow-up to see what's going on, especially given the current circumstances. Or if you could reflect on that a little bit, given, you know, uh, COVID-19 and and of course, like there's been an economic crisis there that's been ongoing since uh, since the 90s, and, and maybe arguably even before that. Uh, but yeah. but um, if you could just have you ever thought of doing a follow up to this, or has anyone uh, been in touch with you that you were in touch with in creating this documentary? Well, I've been in touch because we we screened the documentary both in Miami at, at Florida International University. Uh, and we screen it also at UCF, and and there's a there's a Puerto Rican studies uh, um, a research. Uh, I don't remember the exact name, but there's a research center at UCF, very active, um, and uh, the student organization is also very active. The Puerto Rican student organization. So uh, yeah, well we. I, I went back to screen uh, on both occasions the documentary there, and uh, I'm I'm in touch with with both professors, and we are thinking of actually one UCF was bringing a group uh, to my university this summer. I don't know what's gonna happen with that. It's still on on standstill, so we do want to keep uh, working on that relationship. In terms of doing a second part, I. I wasn't considering it, 
and and I think we I feel so overwhelmed with the coronavirus crisis and we're teaching in Zoom like probably most of you are too that I feel like I'm, I'm overwhelmed and it's just about surviving and and then when it's over we'll see we'll see I you know how 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 is that uh, how how are are you experiencing having gone through hurricane maria and now this whole new crisis how are you experiencing it on a personal level and then how, any reflection about how the people are experiencing it seeing it's almost well, like one well, crisis over another crisis exactly another crisis. exactly well we went through irma first then we went through maria and that was really bad and then we went through ousting ricky rosello the governor because of the whole corruption uh, so he was ousted we have a new governor and uh, i mean she, she kept uh, the same people that were heads of agencies so there's cases of corruption being investigated uh, she's not she's not transparent at all uh, and and now we are on a lockdown this is our third week and officially till april 12th the lockdown uh, at night starts at seven now seven to five nobody's uh, supposed to go out uh, so it's it's a pretty hard situation and uh, if you think of people that suffered the earthquake and lost their homes and are still living in tents imagine what it is like living in tents and going through COVID through this uh, virus crisis uh, with not the sanitary facilities uh, so it, it must be really hard for them are you guys like practicing like social distancing at, at the very least oh. Totally. Since three weeks ago, my university shut down. It was the first one to shut down. It was a, a Thursday. So and those guidelines, all of those guidelines have been uh, really, like from the CDC here, has been transferred over to Puerto Rico and, and the population, like the people who are sleeping outdoors, the people who are in shelters, can they, can they, are they practicing like social distancing? What, what's happening with that? Do you have any idea? Well, the people that lost their homes and weren't in uh, assigned new uh, places and were still living on tents and some of them in tents within their backyards of their homes, they are still there. Uh, people without homes, uh, I saw uh, in the news today, the Iniciativa Comunitaria, they are doing, it's an ONG that does a fantastic a job with people with no homes and people with uh, in drugs. Uh, they visited today 200 people that are without a home and obviously no water. So that's going to be a, a complicated situation. So we really don't know what's going to happen. And how's been, how, how has the, uh, the uh, federal response been to the island? Has there been any communication between the local government and the federal government like FEMA and and the, you know, and the CDC in terms of any type of assistance that might be given to the island? Well, as far as we know, in terms of supplies, no. And if you guys in New York are suffering lack, lack of supplies, imagine here. So mm -hmm. that, that is a problem. Um, until now, we've had 11 dead people and wow. 286 positive cases and about a hundred and something waiting for, for the tests to come back because that's the other issue. The tests are sent to the U.S. and then come back. Uh, but it, it, it's very difficult because you, you hear like interviews with, with people that run ambulances. The hospitals are not taking the sick people. And even the hospital well, that was assigned, a regional public hospital um, that I know because I filmed there, which is almost abandoned since Maria, uh, they were really having a hard time for them to accept uh, these uh, infected people. So what are they doing with them? They're just turning them away? They turn them away. Mm. That is, wow. That's and at the same time, they fired, they're firing people from different hospitals. Imagine the crisis. Why are they firing? Yeah. Because of shortage of funds? It's not clear. That's that's just a 
you know, crazy, yeah. for absolute disaster. Yes, yes. And, uh, I, um, I was wondering also, did you, are there parts in your documentary where you said, oh, I really wish I would have included uh, this other group or this other thing, but, you know, I, I, I can't. Yeah. Did you mentioned yeah, yeah, yeah. about the, some groups or some people that you would have liked to have included. To totally, I would have liked to include Casa Pueblo that juntas because you know it's a it's really interesting project of uh, uh, solar energy and they have uh, uh, now also a solar uh, uh, screening room or small theater. Uh, they sell coffee from the from the neighborhood. They are helping people um, also setting up solar panels if they are on dialysis, for example. So they're doing an amazing work. And I was gonna film them the Sunday that I filmed the, the woman with the, with the hydroponics, but uh, uh, Maso canceled on me. So we, we, we didn't go and, and shoot that. That's the only thing that I miss because I, when I conceptualized the piece and, and together with the two researchers that, that worked on the project was what are the main topics? So we decided health, um, art, uh, social issues, education, um, education of course, uh, and the diaspora. So those were my main topics, and I I looked at the projects that sort of uh, suited in a better in a better way uh, to tell those uh, topics. And uh, are you? Um, I wanted to really bring in uh, Siempre presente because I know they're like burning to say something. I, I have been at Alex. Uh, but, but before introducing them, I just wanted to really, again, uh, reflect a little bit on what you're saying about the whole COVID-19 crisis and how that really now is so urgent in terms of getting resources and help to the island. Um, and you yeah, and you're amazing that you're there and that you're sticking to the island and, and uh, are really bringing attention to it. That was a point that you made in the documentary, or actually it was an interview I did with you for CUNY TV, which yes. you said the most critical thing is to keep Puerto Rico, keep attention, the media, keep a focus on Puerto Rico and what's happening there. And I, and I think your documentary really helps to do that. And so I, I want to commend you for that. Um, I want to bring in uh, Sian Presente now and, and uh, just say that in the spirit, we're all in, in, in this together, as they say. We're, we're all pushing for the well-being of the mm -hmm. island. I also respect the fact that you kept politics out of it. I you did on purpose, you know, because this island is so polarized by political parties, by the two political parties, that uh, it, it would have been another, uh, it would have been tinged by any politician. So you, and you did that wonderfully. I, I, I was amazed how you skirted that whole issue. Um, so let me introduce Sempre Presente. Sem Presente is a collective based in New York that creates connections between Boricuas on the island and those in the diaspora in order to promote and execute responsible and sustainable ideas visions and projects in Puerto Rico. Cien Presente supports grassroots efforts on the island that further self-determination for Puerto Rico and the diaspora. So I want, there are two representatives here, uh, David Galassa and Alex. Where are you, Alex? I'm looking for you. Ah, there you are. And Alex Orama. And so I want you uh, to you know, either one of you can jump in. Maybe you have some questions or comments to make about uh, Sonia's documentary, uh, but I'd like you to also tell us a little bit about uh, what you, you're you engaged in for the island currently. Well, well thank, thank you, uh, thank you, Judith, for, for uh, inviting us to be a part of this conversation. And thank you, Sonia. I, before you know, we started the film, I mentioned that I saw, I had the privilege of seeing the film during the International Puerto Rican Heritage Film Festival uh, mm -hmm. some time ago and breaking bread with Sonia and, and our uh, infamous Theo Louis uh, that everybody knows here in New York City from his work in the media. And uh, I was touched then, I was touched again 
of viewing the film because of all the, the work that went into it. I know it was a labor of love. And, um, you know, just in thinking about COVID and everything that's going on today and, and all the memes that Boricos come up with when dealing with situations, there was one that I saw, a meme that kind of really illustrates what Puerto Rico has been for the last three or four years. And it was a simple meme of a gas container, a backpack, <laughs> and, a, and a face mask. However, there was one thing missing, which was the pan. I think the, the frying pan was missing only because, you know, the gas container symbolizes what happened during Maria and the hurricanes. The backpack, obviously, after the earthquakes, everybody was told to get a go bag with a backpack with all the supplies that they needed. The face mask is obvious for the COVID up, for the coronavirus thing. But the, the pans, is, the frying pans was, uh, like tonight, actually, right now, as we speak, there's a caserazo going on right now. Caserazo. Uh, Caseroso in, in New York and in Puerto Rico about what's going on with the rents and, uh, and people that are being displaced or evicted from their homes and about yeah. also the budget, the budget uh, cuts that are, that are looming in New York and also in Puerto Rico. So I would say those four things are some sort of like emblematic of Puerto Rico's history, uh, unfortunately, these past few years. And I'd also say that, and something that came up in discussions on social media these past couple of days too is, if you want to learn how to survive a crisis, as a Boricua, as a Puerto Rican, having gone through Maria, having gone through the earthquakes, having gone through the political corruption and not going through the coronavirus, if there's nothing that we can't do, we'll invent it. Boricuas have just become as innovative as our brothers and sisters in Cuba in terms of like learning how to do when you just aren't getting what you're supposed to be getting from the powers that be and from those in power and so forth and so forth. So David, could you just talk a little bit about um, some projects that you're engaged sure. in? <laughs> I was going to get to that. I was going to, I just want to press it with all of that. I mean, so, I love the pep talk. Yay! So, and Alex, feel free to to Because I'd to, like to support you and just like we'd like to support see, you. Know, see, you know, so, so what Siempre Sente basically is, is a collective of, fo of folks that have come together, um, especially after Maria, but even before Maria, during the um, the junta and the budget cuts in Puerto Rico to support frontline community-based organizations in Puerto Rico, like Comedores Sociales de Puerto Rico, like Ajitalte, like Casa Pueblo, like Kilometro Cero, and like... Um, eh, uh, Pandemitopia. Pandemitopia and... Uh, and, uh, and uh, ¿Cómo se dice la...? la Feministas de Construcción. Eh, uh, the feminist group in Puerto Rico también. Eh, ah, el, co eh, el col eh. colectiva, la colectiva feminista. Colectiva. So we've done these last two and a half years, three years, um, we've come together here to do different events. We call them hang hangueos and justicias um, at different, preferably or mostly Latino owned uh, restaurants or bars. And we've come to come together, not only for the happy hour and for the camaraderie, but also to elevate the work that these different organizations are doing in Puerto Rico. And we've done uh, silent auctions. We've done different ways, you know, raffles and so forth. And we've raised anywhere from a thousand to three thousand dollars in one shot. Um, no strings attached, no proposals that I have to write because we know we've already established a lot of the relationships with these organizations, these frontline groups that continue to do the good work on the ground in Puerto Rico. And for instance, right now, even during this, um, this outbreak, this pandemic, we know that, for instance, um, Ajitalte is doing work on a, on a regular basis. You can see them on IG doing these great panels and these conversations about what's going on with the, you know, with the more disenfranchised communities in Puerto Rico. We know that Comedores Sociales is already doing a colecta of food mm -hmm. to bring to seniors and to other people that are not able to go to supermarkets or it's unsafe for them to go to supermarkets and, and such, or poor communities that don't have access to, to food. And just all these different groups, you know, the even even like I said, even before Maria, but especially especially uh, fortified after Maria, these relationships between a lot of the Boricuas here in New York City, and also um, the folks that have been doing the group, the, the good work on the ground uh, in Puerto Rico post Maria, post the earthquakes, and post the uh, the junta in Puerto Rico. One group that I failed to mention was um, working on, on the earthquakes after. Um, the earthquakes was uh, Brigada Solidaria del Oeste. So mm. we've established a, kind of, uh, a number of relationships with all these different groups uh, in Puerto Rico and also in Vieques. And, um, and we want to continue to do this kind of work in solidarity. As, as, so the, earthquakes, 
as the earthquakes happened, um, and also as um, this outbreak, we had been planning to send a delegation of, of some present uh, members to visit with some of the folks that we've worked with these past couple of years. And unfortunately, has been put on hold for now. But that's hopefully something that we can do in the future. Alex, you want to? I, I wanted to just like bring in uh, Alex into the conversation a little bit. Alex, yeah. you, how have you been participating? And for how long? How, how, what's been your involvement with with Sent uh, Percent? Then, what, what, and what you know, what's your engagement with it? I, I've kind of been there since the the beginning with it. Uh, me and David have been protesting prior to the the hurricane, like, like you said. So, it it could be anything from I cooked chili last time. Uh, I have artwork sometimes that we donate. We have artist friends. Uh, when we need it, it's a, it's a, literally a collective. So it's it's whatever you can do. If you have a, an issue and you have the backing and the people that are connected to the people on the island, then, you know, that's, you know, anybody could, can lead in, in this group. Nobody's a, there's no hierarchy in our group. It's, it's what's, what's the issue and what's the, you know, what's, what's needed at, at most right now. So um, that's been our, our main focus. And how do you, how do you see guys, how do you see um, like, uh, like, it, it, it seems like as a collective, you, you guys like engage in like very specific uh, issues, like almost topical issues, and then sort of like uh, go from one group to another group and, uh, and sort of assist them. And how do you establish like a continuity or a, a kind of network of them? Do you ever think of connecting all of these groups that you're involved with into some sort of network? Does ever, is, is that, that, that was our, our idea. Um, we, were, we were supposed to go to Puerto Rico in, in April for um, Casa Pueblo. I believe David said they're having a, a celebration or anniversary. And our, one of our ideas was to try to sit down with all the people that we have so far worked with in the past and just see how we can create, you know, just do the same thing and just keep, keep it going and see what else is needed. And, uh, keep the, I guess the the fight going on. You know, just try to connect with the people and create a network, like you said, so that way other people can just start helping them out as well. And not, not you don't have to come to an event to to donate to these people. So the idea is to make it just a network that you can look up and whoever you want to donate donate to, whether it be food or medicine or education. You know, that's that's I think that's the main idea we're, we're trying to work towards. Do you ever think of like getting uh, like uh, filmmakers or media uh, people like such as uh, Sonia Fritz in, in involved in some capacity and, and, uh, or some, some of her students like who work in media who might be able to ex expand like the outreach? Um, either, I, either of you, either David yeah. or, or Alex, both of you. Uh, the funny thing is we, in our collective, we have uh, some people that are in film and uh, some actors as well, but I would I, I would totally be open to to that as well. It's it's you know I don't think there's any uh, barrier at this point of who we would want to work with it, as far as getting the message out and you know reaching the people. David, yeah. well, going back to the original the other question about um, getting these groups together, it's been it's been my experience, and I'm sure you know Alex Tambien when he goes to Puerto Rico is that that a lot of these issues are intersectional. And, and, and when you go to the protest in front of the Fortaleza, or you go to some uh, some activity, um, you'll see La Colectiva, you'll see the folks from Comedores, you'll see La Jornada, you'll see a lot of these different groups because you know they're they're all interconnected, and there's so many issues. Mm -hmm. um, so you know it's hard it's hard to you know our, our, our sort of like our passion is to try to help as many people as possible, and. Um, and then to connect as much as many people here from the diaspora uh, to to the different groups in Puerto Rico, I think you know, it, in terms of like getting um, document, you know, people documenting things like that. Yeah, we're always you know. Uh, uh, people have their phones, right? <laughs> yeah, everybody everybody always takes pictures and videos of it. And we also, and I know Sonia knows these groups too. Um, we've, we've been wanting to do some work with like Adoc PR, for instance. And yeah, I'm part of that uh, association. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah, you know, a collective of, of filmmakers and documentarians in Puerto Rico that you know could use uh, assistance or some support as well because uh, there's so much talent in Puerto Rico everywhere you look yeah. in terms of yeah, sure. filmmaking and documentary work and artists and also in the diaspora. So much creativity going back and forth. We do things too. It's true. It's true. <laughs>
<laughs> and uh, and yeah, we need to do a better job sometimes just documenting these enlaces, you know, going back and forth. And maybe that's something that we could have actually done, or we actually may still do. Uh, like Alex had mentioned, we had planned to go to the 40th anniversary of Casa Pueblo. And Casa Pueblo is very near and dear to me uh, personally because that's how I started really connecting more as a diasporican with with the, you know with my brothers and sisters in Puerto Rico when I got involved with the the battle against the gas pipeline in Puerto Rico, the gas mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And yeah. so we had already you know I had already I had family in Puerto Rico. I'd been going back and forth for many many years, but it wasn't really up until that time that I started truly really connecting with my peers and started fighting with them alongside them and felt more a synergy than this us, you know, somos de afuera, somos del norte, somos del imperio, somos gringo. Yeah. Uh, I didn't, you know, ever since that, I felt, I've, I've always just felt more and more love. And especially after Maria, you know, um, the way that we worked together, because we all, we're all we had, um, I think we even brought us even more, you know, closer together. And it's funny because I put out an email or a text to our comrades in Puerto Rico, you know, with this Corona thing started getting heating up. And they were like, Papa, don't worry about it. Take care of yours because New York is hotter than Puerto Rico right now. So it's like, you know, it's a, it was an interesting situation. Oh, Sonia, what do you, how do you uh, like see possibly, because I think you, you do both documentary and features. And, I, right. and, and, and so for me, that's always like uh, something that's sort of complex because part of you, it's almost like two parts of your brain in a sense. And uh, how do you see, uh, you, 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 you can approach your work as issue oriented through documentary, or you could approach your work as like a fictional narrative uh, covering issues too, the, the way you did with um, America, which had to do with domestic violence, which was sort of fascinating. And uh, migration too. Mm -hmm. and yeah, and, the, and included the migration too, because the guy you know, actually hunts her down yeah. and looks for her yeah. uh, here. And so how, how could you relate that to, let's say, like the activities that Sempre Presente is doing in terms of um, bringing the diaspora down to the island in the sense of, of trying to really aid, provide some sort of support and how, how the diaspora too gets a lot, just as David says, the love that is able to like come out, that comes forth, that, that always actually surprises me that how much of that spirit that's maybe revolutionary or that's so wanting Generous. to contribute. Yeah. How would you, how do you work with that? Like that two levels, like. Well, I, I think your question is, has two parts. The first part combining documentary and, and feature films. Normally they are connected because I'm interested, the topics I'm interested in, in are appear in the documentaries and in feature films. Mm -hmm. The thing is that doing a feature film, as you know, because it requires a, a much, much bigger budget and a, a bigger crew and uh, it's so much more complex than a documentary, uh, it takes me years to raise a, a feature film. Mm -hmm. While a documentary I can raise in a much uh, faster way. So, it helps me telling stories, no, no matter if it's a, in, in documentary or in feature because the topics are there and they are the same and they're sort of a, a continuum in a way. Mm. And the other part about uh, hooking up with, with Simple Present and the Diaspora and all that, uh, I think everyone is connected here. Uh, as, as David mentioned and Alex, uh, there's, what we call umbrellas, sombrillas, sombrillas under, under which there are so many ONGs all over the island and everybody knows each other. Like the other day there was a, a celebration because uh, some of the feminist women that have been fighting for years and years here established finally a Fundación para las Mujeres in part because the issue of domestic violence is very, is, is really bad. And now with, with people having to stay at home, it's getting worse. Yeah. Uh, so, and, and there's so many other organizations that are working with that topic and also health women and their families. So it's like, we know each other, we know what each organization does. I have friends that are in one or another or 
a, a friend of mine who just retired, a colleague of mine, she's working with Coordinadora Paz de la Mujer and working specifically with people that were displaced by, by the earthquake and working on health. And I have another one who's working uh, with a psychological situation that because it's still trembling. I, like yesterday, they had like Trends. six earthquakes. One, one was like a four point something. So add the, the earthquake to the uh, virus crisis, it's, it's, it's bad. It's really bad. So they have this whole school of post-traumatic stress thing going on. I wanted uh, Professor Jody Rora to, to connect, but I, I don't really see her. Like she, she also brings doctors down and also now a team trying to bring down uh, teams of uh, therapists down to the island to really work with the, the population on, on this question of just the trauma of, of, of having tremors. It's not just the earthquake, but that yeah. the tremors are occurring uh, uh, constantly and, and recurring. And they say it's gonna happen throughout, uh, for the rest of the year, if not more. I, I, um, so I wanted to also like open this up because I know you guys have been really patient. I'm sure you're all going like, I want to get in here and like, and, and comment. So guys, like, please, do you have any questions, any of your comments, uh, this wonderful documentary, also the activities of Siempre Sente? I, I just wanted to say thank you, Sonia, for, for, for the film. And it was, it was great to see Puerto Rico. I, I, miss, I miss the island very much. I, I try to go at least once a year. Um, uh -huh. So it's like, I started crying and stuff like that, but anyway. Um, I, I wanted to know, what do you know about the funds that were supposedly the, the governor made available, like $900 million or, or something like that, and that's supposed to go to schools, hospitals, and now you're telling me that hospitals are firing people, so. Yeah, to know. small businesses and to people that have been uh, not basically unemployed for three weeks now, for sure till April 12th and I'm sure it's going to be extended. So like each each person that works uh, by himself or herself is going to receive $500 uh, and I already got a call from from the uh, from the accountant and it's happening. And small business is 1500. I have friends that have a small business they can do I mean 1500 doesn't help Maybe. really. Right. Doesn't help. It's not a rescue like they they're doing in France. Uh, so the, the economic situation is going to be so, so hard after COVID because the island depends so much on tourism for once uh, and there's nobody on the beaches now. Um, there's hardly any tourists. So if the small businesses um, uh, stop, stop being, uh, stop paying their few workers imagine what it what it's gonna do uh, as a repercussion for all the i mean we're already in a big debt so apparently this money that the governor promised uh, is instead of paying the the monthly due to our borrowers mm -hmm. it's gonna be uh, dedicated to for the crisis to get out of this crisis what's going to happen next month uh, we don't know so it's it's really a very very hard situation not only health wise but also economically it's very very hard anybody else hello on here say something oh here we go here we go could the yes yeah, speak could you speak up Wait a minute. It's Ariana. Hi, I was waiting to make sure it was me. Thank yeah. You. yeah, sorry. I'm like, Hi, uh, I'm Ariana. I'm a dual language director in the South Bronx. Um, some of my students were on here with me tonight. I just wanted to say thank you so much. This was shared with me by a colleague um, who knew about the film. And so we had a number of students from the South Bronx that tuned in today because we're writing a project about this. Sonia's work is now going into some of our research. Um, we have about 60 students in the South Bronx writing about Maria, before and after Maria. Uh, 
in Puerto Rico. And this film was amazing. It was super, super helpful for our students that have been researching this and giving you an idea, they're middle and high school students that are writing this. Um, but the film was phenomenal. Yeah, I, th I think I think for students, this is just so educational. Like it's it's a really good I mean, we're, we're getting a lot of. Uh, the must be um, unmuted, and you can hear the background. Yeah. Here, here. Uh, uh, were you wanting to say something? Yeah, I was going to say I, I I really enjoyed the film. Uh, I, I was Googling, was, I was trying to get on earlier. I heard about this on BAI. Oh, this morning. No, not this morning. It was last week, I believe. Uh, uh, oh, okay. You, yeah, but anyway, uh, but I tried to get on it. It, said, uh, the, uh, it was filled, so I'm glad I got to Judy through another way to get to this. But while I was doing that, I saw that this is available on Amazon Prime. Is that right? No, the documentary is on yeah. I, I thought I saw that. Maybe there's another film with that name. I thought it said uh, Amazon Prime, you can get it. But anyway, uh, I had a question about the, the, uh, the grandmother with the with the, uh, the, the, uh, the young person who I guess had cerebral palsy. Uh, yeah. They, they have until June of this year. The uh, HBO, one of the hardest parts was watching that film about how the folks had to leave the hotel. Is that something that's going to be happening, do you think? Mm -hmm. This is for Sonia, the question. Uh, I think that people that left again uh, because of the hurricane, which was uh, January 6th, those people left for Florida as far as I know. And I don't know if it had to do with the weather, that it was so cold in New York, they already had family in Orlando. Uh, so, in people now going to New York, not that I know of, of the people I know or friends of friends that you know are my friends. Uh, the crisis is going to be another set. You mute everybody except Sonia. A lot of doctors. Can you hear me? Judith, can Hello. you mute everybody except Sonia because there's a lot of background noise. Yeah, we can hear you, Sonia. Now it's... Whoever is hosting the meeting can mute everyone and then Sonia could unmute herself. Yeah. That may get Sonia, rid of the background mute. Yourself. Unmute yourself, Sonia. She's unmuted. Unmute I can tell. Oh, you're on? Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah. But I meant for the other background noise. You could just uh, uh, mute everyone and then that way you can ensure that only the person speaking gets can speak. Thank That's you. All. Thank you. Yeah. Does anybody? So, yes, I was... Yeah. Go ahead, because uh, we we were you were muted somehow, and we, we didn't hear okay. part of what you said. So our so this, other. So this film is not on, on Amazon. Is that correct? I was I was mistaken by that that the film is not available on Amazon no. Prime. Okay. This documentary, Después de Maria, is just on YouTube. Maybe you're thinking of the other of the other story uh, of the two women that live in shelters in New York. That's I think on Netflix. Oh right, yeah right. The that one has produced yeah. from New York. Right. Yeah, you actually. What's great about your documentary? You made it available to people. They could just go, you know, and see it for for free and not pay anything which is also like just a statement about you as a filmmaker. I think that's really a wonderful gesture and a commitment, uh, you know, what you represent in terms of helping and, and really dando apoyo, you know, supporting uh, the island. So yeah, I, I, I commend you for that. It's uh, also because I, I knew that things were uh, moving so fast that the documentary was only, only going to have a certain period of life and, and be sort of um, up to date. And now that I watch it, it, it's changed already so much, but I think it does capture that period and, and that year and, and maybe last year, but then since the change of government and then the earthquakes and then now it's completely changed. And, and of it's course- still It's still inspiring. I'm sorry. Yeah, the, 
the only thing that doesn't change is our debt, and that's a, a real worry. And it keeps growing, right? Oh my God. They're, they're cutting pensions for people. They're raising uh, the quotas at UPI, the University of Puerto Rico, that was for free. They've raised it already, the uh, UHS, which was the, the uh, high school, uh, has also now a $500 quota per month. Uh, so there's privatization, and there's corruption, there's the debt. It's like very complicated situation. I mean, the, I mean, we could look at also just reflecting on the, the supply, the water supply, because I remember like being in my aunt's house and she was just getting a trickle. And depending on the time of day, she either had, and this was, this was in, in Bayamon, like she either she had the water or, or at times like it wasn't there, which is, you know, uh, you know all the vulnerabilities that, that really became manifest, the uh, vulnerabilities on the island, like the, the water, the uh, electrical power grid, uh, the uh, health healthcare education. system, the educational system, and um, really the food supply. The fact that Puerto Rico has like a two week, I mean, they're importing so much of their food that yeah. it's, it's sort of, all of that's really frightening given the whole context that's emerged just recently with this, this virus. Um, yeah. this, do other people have any, uh, Questions or comments? I just want to add, Judith, that even in the midst of this, there's still people that are profiting off the pain in Puerto Rico. You know, oh, yeah. we've got the John Paulson of this world, we've got the hedge fund vultures, yet still, like Sonia said, want to get paid. You know, we still have the Act 20 and 22 people that supposedly live in Puerto Rico so they can avoid paying taxes. Those folks are still operating in Puerto Rico. In fact, probably more are coming in. You know, cryptocurrency guys, all these folks that want to cheat on their taxes have been flocking to Puerto Rico. A lot of professionals, our youth, our students have had no choice but to leave the island. So that that needs to be highlighted as well because they're, you know, at, 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 a, at a point time, at, a, at a very vulnerable time in Puerto Rico too, where you know the um, the island has also been deemed uh, what is it, Sonia? A, where the whole island is special special zone, special yeah, uh, sort of a an opportunity. A, yeah. A paradise because if you invest, you don't pay taxes. And then the oh, whole ninety-nine right. percent of the island is an opportunity zone now, right? So basically, everything is up for sale, and mm. it's a fire sale, and people are well, scooping the properties left and right. And that's out. that's really uh, uh, another issue: the fact that Puerto Rico, when it was first, well, when ELA was established, the Commonwealth was established, the whole idea and the whole concept behind it was that Puerto Rico would have certain light industries and that that would really maintain the island. It was not going to depend on tourism. And that's like really shifted. And, 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 and one of the big issues also was that the beaches would always remain public. They would never be privatized. And what's going on now is the attempt to privatize the beaches. And that really flies against the, the, the constitution of the island. It's like uh, so many things are being suspended because of this debt. And, and trying to meet uh, these neoliberal demands. I think that's really critical, this idea of the, the free islands. And I just wanna uh, really cite that there was, there was a docu not a documentary, a feature film, a Puerto Rican feature film called um, uh, La Palomilla with, uh, that starred uh, Jaime Sanchez. And in that film, that was in the 60s, that film came out. The opening scene is on a beach and how, um, an American a woman from the U.S. She's she's in the beach, and then two Puerto Ricans show up, and a, a young couple, and they're like taking off their clothes. They're gonna go swimming or something, and she's staring at them. And then the man walks over to her and says, "What are you looking at?" And she says, "Who are you? You don't belong on this beach." And he said, he tells her, "What are you talking about? This is my country. This is my beach." And they get into an altercation, and he slaps her, and then she calls for the the uh, the uh, the MPs, the military police, and they come and they arrest him. And that's the beginning of the legend of La Palomilla, which is based on a true story. So it's sort of fascinating that then that was going on, maintaining the beaches free. And I remember my aunt was telling me that they weren't they were prohibited from going to the beaches, and then. 
so that was established that the beaches would be public and now there's this whole privatization effort. It's also because of the inefficiency of the government, like we didn't have a head of, of natural resources for so many months and, and, and knowing this, this uh, the party that is in power, they were already trying to sell uh, our natural resources. Yeah, they want to sell the Yunque. Bueno, Yunque is already a, a federal park. Yeah, has been uh, yeah. So many, right, right. Yeah. No, but a lot, of, a lot, a lot of the island has been sold for bio sale prices. You know, going back to the tourism piece, La Concha Hotel, the Vanderbilt, are all owned by John Paulson. He's got a bunch of other properties in Fajardo. You've got Prouty, pretty much has um, a lot of properties in San Dulce. You've got this other guy, Saint Clair, uh, buying up properties in Isla Verde. So it's very, you know, very few touristy properties along Condado, the Greater San Juan area. They actually belong to Puerto Ricanos, even Puerto Rican companies at this point. So they're just gobbling up properties left and right. And, um, and, and there's nobody to really push back, unfortunately, on, on, on a lot of this, because this is happening on such a wide, widespread basis. On, on the other hand, I live on Loisa Street, and, and as you know, it's being gentrified, heavily gentrified. But at the same time, there's small restaurants and small bars and tattoo shops and uh, they are owned by small, uh, young entrepreneurs from Puerto Rico. And I just wanted to add uh, also that young people are going back to the, to the countryside to work on agriculture, um, mainly because as a consequence of Maria and, and seeing how we really didn't have, uh, we were not uh, sustainable at all. So I think there's a tendency of younger people going back to, to to sell produce and I sent JT a couple of, of links of people that deliver uh, local produce to your home and it's happening now. Right. Uh, there's also people that are restoring old buildings and this is again young people doing that. Uh, there's um, free uh, legal help to help people that are being evicted. So there's a lot of interesting and, and generous people working like all over the island and, and in lots of different projects. So in my case, I, that, that, hell, that gives me so much hope. That's thank really you saying, thank you for saying that, Sonia, because that is a hopeful note. And, and I'm glad you, you, know, and you started it with that because, and I'm sorry, Judy, I, I just wanted to go back to something that Judy said to you, Sonia, about the film, not getting, delving into politics. And if there's one thing that's really impressed me about Comedores Sociales and a lot of the other groups that we've worked with these past couple of years is that they know that that place is infested, you know, that, that, that this is so much garbage on the political sector that their whole mantra has been to, you know what, let's show how we can create a better Puerto Rico. And they've gone yeah. back to the land, they've created these organizations, they've been self-sustainable, they've put, pushed mutual aid to a point where people in the United States are learning about mutual aid from people in Puerto Rico, and that's given me a lot of hope too. It's, it's a beautiful thing to see, and it all goes back go back to that old adage: we could feed ourselves, we could free ourselves, and yeah. that's the kind of politics that I want to really get into because that's the kind of politics that's really going to su sustain us into into the future. Yeah, I think that's really critical. This idea that first of all, you need an agricultural base if whatever you want autonomy, if you want independence you need to have an agricultural base. You have to be able to feed your people. If not, yeah. you're not really going anywhere. You're gonna really be dependent. Uh, the, the other, so that's really a, a, a really great thing. I always said like the vanguard of Puerto Rico is really the farmer, you know, like where is he? And so that's part of it. Um, as far as El Yunque is concerned, it's sort of fascinating too, it's history because there were people that used to live in El Yunque and when it, would, when it, was, when it became part of the federal uh, national parks chain, all of those uh, chain, all those people were like basically pushed down. It happened around the 60s and 70s, I think. But what's really interesting about that too, that um, uh, one scholar in the island said it was a good thing that it was nationalized, that it became federal, part of the federal park system, because if not, people probably sold off parts of it. 
And so that though, so it's so ironic that that's a, that was that's a way of protecting it. And and actually, he stated that in relation to Vieques as well, because he said, you know, it's been people are parceling it out and like selling whatever they have and moving out, and and it's all being taken over as well. But he but he, but. Uh, he also emphasized the parts that where the naval left that remain within the federal, the U.S. system. He said, well, at least, you know, it's not being uh, sold off. M maybe not yet. Yeah, the, the part that is uh, run by Fish and Wildlife. But you know what the interesting thing is that you see there is a, um, the idea of strangling people from Culebra and Vieques because when they moved the ferry to, to Ceiba, which is like an awful port to, because there's really no infrastructure. Uh, it's it's really bad, and and then having the boats uh, being uh, disabled every so often, and people really suffering, and I think that's all on purpose. So they sell because if if, if someone gets to their house and says, "Well, I give you forty thousand, sixty thousand cash now," they will sell and leave, and I think that's. That is really a, a project to have as few. I think it's it's going towards Hawaii in a way. So local people will leave, and then this is going to be paradise for for tourists. And and, and then they, and then you could push for statehood. Once you depopulate it and repopulate it with with another people, then you can have that push as a possibility. Um, but um, you know, whether, whatever your politics are, as 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 that's concerned. I mean, I don't want to get into that whole status thing because that's like a <laughs> you know, it's really just like a den of worms or, or, or something. But does anybody else have any comments or any questions to ask uh, these like brilliant people? Please. I just want to say that I'm really glad that uh, everyone participated in watching this film. I'm really glad to have Sonia here talking about it. And I think one thing that your film does, even if it's about a period of time, is that it really inspires us to see how if when community takes control of their own lives that there, that there is a way out and that yeah. may be the what we're going to have to do now um post post fires as well um and in terms of the ngos that sonia sonia sent me a list and i will be following up with a email to all of you so that you'll have that list of the different groups um that uh she's suggesting that you might pay attention to and possibly donate to and cian presente if you have ones that you want um, also to be included, pop me an email and I'll include that in the general email to everybody. Cool. And thank you, JT and, and City College and Judith for hosting this and, and David and Alex for sharing um, your experiences with us as well. Thank you. And I want to thank all of you for really uh, having an interest, a sustained interest in the island because let's face it, our policies here, whether you're Puerto Rican or, you know, just from the state's state side, our whatever we're doing here is impacting the island. And and so far, you know, what's going on is really negative in terms of the fiscal uh, crush that's being placed on that island. And um, well, I, I God bless all of you, man. You know, take care of yourselves. Be safe. And thank you, JT and Sonia, really, always no, Thank you, everyone, for, for being part of this. David, Alex, take care. Thank you, Third World Newsreel. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. God bless.